And joining us now here on the program, Vice President of Fertilizer at Stone X, Josh Linville is with us to give us an update on what's happening in the fertilizer markets. And Josh, great to catch up with you, sir. It's been a been a little while. Happy New Year to you. I hope you're doing well. You as well. Yeah, getting through it. Got to the start of the year. We got our big race done there uh, beginning of January. Family and I made the trip down, so that was always a good time. And trying to get back in the swing. And like we said, uh, a lot of travel between now and the start of spring. Yeah, we were talking just off air, just the amount of farm shows that have already happened and seminars and you name it and more yet to come here the next uh, couple of weeks ahead before we dive into the heart of spring planting season. And, you know, speaking of spring planting season in the U.S. here, Josh, I know we continue to watch fertilizer prices. A lot of farmers watching the price here as we head into that spring planting season. But just to kind of take a step back here the last couple of weeks, Feels like we've started to see a lot of prices continue to fall when it comes to fertilizer. What's what's the latest you're seeing right now, Josh? It is uh, everything, and especially it's all depending on when you look at it from. I'll tell you what: if you go back in time, twelve months, it is a drastically different marketplace. Twelve months ago, we were worried: is there going to be enough inventory around the world? We can't get ahead of it. People couldn't buy quick enough. All these problems around the world, and that's why we ended up hitting our all-time high. On a lot of these prices, we moved into that late March, early April time period. Now it's been the exact opposite. Demand has been almost non-existent around the world. Buyers have seen some of the uh, the weakness in the armor, and they're exploiting it, waiting until as long as humanly possible before pulling the trigger. The sellers, of course, are feeling the pressure. They continue to drop price, find the, trying to find demand. So you're seeing everything be half, or if not less than half, of where it was 12 months ago. And now everybody's kind of like, oh my gosh, here we are. We're second half of January. How much lower can this thing go? I mean, eventually world demand has got to pop up getting ready for spring, but how much longer can they wait? I, that's the magic question out there. And I know there's a lot of people that are probably a little upset saying, hey, I'm not seeing all these uh, moves dollar for dollar inland, but we got to remember there's still some logistical problems. There's still a lot of stuff to move. We are still dealing with a higher cost logistical avenue than what we have been. Well, and I look across the board, I mean, urea, UAN, nitrogen, potash, everything for the most part, phosphate, everything is kind of seems to be on that downward trend. Maybe, you know, some uh, some types uh, more so than others, but overall, it just feels like that trend downward. And as you mentioned, that demand just not there right now, Josh. It's not. And I'll tell you, this is something I got wrong. Uh, we went into the end of the year. Now, we had fully expected December to be a very quiet period. Uh, the only world demand that we expect on the nitrogen side was going to be India. Well, the problem is they bought almost 3 million tons a month in November. They did not need to buy in December. So we figured December was going to be relatively quiet and that would cause prices to fall because everybody likes, you got to feed a bull every day or else mm -hmm. it's going to starve. Um, but I, what I did not anticipate that we would get three quarters of the way through January and still not see that demand come forward. So that has really put the pressure, you know, producers around the world continue to produce every single day. Those stockpiles grow, those, that risk continues to grow. The question in my mind is when does that demand step forward? It's not that the demand has gone away. None of us think that all this demand has just disappeared. It is more the fact that it's just waiting as long as possible. But get it, it's like a dam. The longer we wait, the more that water level rises. And eventually that wall is going to break. And the higher it goes, when it breaks, it hits that much harder. So from what starting price to, you know, is it an even lower starting price? And then we see prices pop up. Um, these are all the questions we're trying to figure out. Q1 is always kind of a squirrely period anyway. This one more than others. Well, you mentioned you're doing a lot of traveling. What are you hearing from producers uh, across the across the country, across North America, when it comes to this lack of demand? What is some of the reasoning that a lot of folks are waiting? Is it because they want to see how low these prices can get? Is it still the you know the relationship between the price of corn? wheat, et cetera, not penciling out correctly. What are you hearing when it comes to this, some of this lack of demand from the producer side, Josh? I think it's all of that. And ultimately it comes down to for the first time since the summer of 2020, buyers smell blood in the water and they like it. They love it. They have been sitting there getting pushed and prodded and pulled and being told what to do and when they're going to do it. And we're finally seeing the markets come back to the buyer. The buyer finally has some power at the negotiation table. And they want their pound of flesh. And yeah, it's when you're in a falling market, even if you see a number where if it makes sense, for example, you sit there and say, well, yeah, but what if it goes down to the $20, $30 a ton? Let's just wait. I mean, at this point, if it drops down and then it rallies back up $20, $30 and I have to pay that higher price, 
I'm okay with that. I want the market to prove itself to me. And right now the market has not proven itself. So I think demand overall continues to be very cagey because it sees that downward slide. Um, there's a lot of questions on what form of nitrogen, for example, are people going to use? We have heard a tremendous amount of UAN users saying, I'm going to be doing more urea. Actually, I had a conversation with somebody up in the Northern Plains who normally puts on anhydrous saying the same thing. I typically put on anhydrous. I bought a spreader. I'm putting urea on because it's so much cheaper than the alternative. Uh, phosphate and potash, I am getting more bold up on the demand because that price has come down so far. It actually looks like it's in line. It looks like it's decent. That and potash looks decent compared to like December 23 corn prices. So I think that demand is coming around. But again, why would a buyer step in today when you can wait a few weeks and hopefully that price falls? Do we wonder as well if some of the uh, the price moves here could have an effect on what farmers put in the ground this spring? Because I know that acre battle is yep. still in front of us here in the U.S., Josh. It is. We continue to talk about 93 million acres internally. Uh, there are some that after the last USA report are saying, well, maybe it's something a little bit closer to 92. But OK, I, I'm OK with that. 92, 93 million acres. That is still a very, very big demand number if we're putting on normal application rates of phosphate and potash and if the nitrogen is there, which, of course, it has to be if you're going to plant corn. Um, that fear is of course going to be there that, oh, the spring's going to be terrible again, like it was last year. We're not going to get the corn acres in the ground, but unfortunately that's a reactionary thing. That's something that we won't be able to tell until April 15, April 30. Well, Josh, as you look at everything as a whole here, first part of the year, working through the winter doldrums, anything else on your mind, anything else you're keeping an eye on when it comes to, uh, fertilizer prices or just the, the global outlook in general? The, the biggest two things I'm watching today is number one, from a nitrogen perspective, of course, is that European production, because we've continued to see that natural gas price fall. I mean, we last August, I think it was, their Dutch TTF value got, and that's the European price that we track, got up to $103 an MMBTU. For reference, the US has been somewhere between three and nine on the Henry Hub. So incredibly high numbers. And nobody thought there was any chance. I mean, Russia was gonna to ship tons through them. Imports were gonna be limited. Winter demand was coming. There's no way price were gonna fall. Jesse, in the last week, we've been anywhere from 17 to 20. And there's a lot of speculation, ourselves included, that more production restarts are going to come. And if those production restarts happen, of course, nitrogen prices are under even further attack. So that's the big one that we're watching right now. The second one is when that demand steps forward. Because I am afraid when everybody waits and waits and waits, that's great. They win. But then all of a sudden, everybody tries to slam through that door at once. And all of a sudden, guess where that negotiation power goes to? right back to the supplier. Do you want this price? Oh, you don't? I'll go to the sucks other people who are wanting to buy as well. I'll go see if they want to pay it. I'll let you know what my next price is. And it, it goes back to their side of the table. A lot of things to keep an eye on. And of course, uh, we'll stay close with you as we watch what's going on with the fertilizer markets. Josh Linville, Vice President of Fertilizer at Stonex. Thanks for joining us today. We'll talk to you again soon. Absolutely. Thanks, sir.